Hey what's up guys it's Kelly welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to be giving some book recommendations based on iconic albums in my life. If you find yourself enjoying this video then please don't forget to give it a thumbs up it really helps me out and if you're new here and would like to see more of me then please subscribe. So my taste in music has changed pretty significantly <laughs> over the course of my 24 years on this planet and I have this idea that I wanted to recommend books based on like eras of music in my life but when I was trying to brainstorm it I just didn't like how the list was coming out I didn't like how like broad the categories were it just it wasn't working for me so I tweaked the idea a little bit and decided to instead recommend books based on specific albums that I feel have just been iconic to me at certain stages of my life <laughs> first up we have Barbie Dance Party. I don't know at the time of filming this if I'm going to be able to actually find a picture of the cover of the CD for you because I looked and I could not find one except for one that was very very grainy so if that's all we get I'm sorry. This is the first CD that I remember owning, like this is the first CD that I remember being mine and not like belonging to my parents or belonging to my sisters, like this was my CD and I loved it. I listened to this like every day when I came home from school, it was just, it was a good, good time. I very possibly did own CDs before this but this is just like the one that sticks out in my mind and I did find the track list so I'm gonna share that beauty with you guys. Larger Than Life, The Backstreet Boys, Can't Get You Out Of My Head, Kylie Minogue, Bop Bop Baby, Westlife, Oops I Did It Again, Britney Spears, Any One Of Us, Stupid Mistake by Gareth Gates, Complicated by Avril Lavigne, One Love by Blue, Genie in a Bottle by Christina Aguilera, Once In A Lifetime by Heinz Winkler, Round Round by The Sugar Babes, If Tomorrow Never Comes, The Groove Brothers Remix by Ronan Keating, Absolutely Everybody by Vanessa Amorosi, which I have had stuck in my head all day since I looked up the tracklist for this album. Heaven by DJ Sammy, Say Cheese, Smile Please by The Fast Food Rockers, Rock the World by Bubbles, Dance to the Music by Hampton the Hamster, You Promised Me or Tu Es Futu by Ingrid, Chihuahua by DJ Bobo, Mandy the new DJ dance mix, Summer of 69 the DJ mix and It's My Party by Ice. Can we just appreciate the iconic nature of that track list? Like have you ever heard anything that screams early noughties more than that track list? It was amazing. I mean this is not even an iconic album in my life, it is just an iconic album in general apart from the fact that I think I'm like the only person that's ever heard of it. <laughs> so Barbie Dance Party Volume 2 was a big album in my life and to go with that I would recommend the Georgia Nicholson series by Louise Renison. I love this series, it's so much fun. So we follow Georgia Nicholson who is a teenage girl living in England and the books are just like the most ridiculous things happening in her life. It's her troubles with friends, it's her troubles with boys, her troubles with her parents. She has the most absurd life and you just follow it along as she's writing about it in her diary. Much like Barbie Dance Party Volume 2, it is completely ridiculous, it is completely over the top, but it is also a real good time. And I would highly recommend that you read these if you haven't already, they're so funny. They, I don't think they've aged well. I, I probably shouldn't be recommending them because they probably haven't aged well <laughs> to someone who doesn't have a lot of nostalgia tied into them, but I really like them and they do scream mid 2000s. So as I was reflecting on my music listening past, the next album that really stood out to me was The Black Parade by My Chemical Romance. This came out in 2006, possibly 2007. Either way, I was 10 when I listened to it for the first time and I just had never heard music like that before. My Chemical Romance, as you'll see later in this video, went on to become a very very important band to me but at that point I think I was just, I loved that they were like loud and angry and it was something that I knew my mom probably wouldn't be thrilled about me listening to because there was some swearing. At that point in my life I wouldn't have been able to put it into words but it just, it, that album meant so much to me and it was so different to anything that I heard before and I liked that it was dark and I, I liked that it was different and there were these emotions that I hadn't heard explored in music before and I definitely hadn't heard explored like that in music before. Although it was 
very dark and very sad there was this beautiful message of hope in it so for that I'm recommending The Graveyard Book by Neil Gaiman. So in The Graveyard Book we follow Nobody Owens, affectionately referred to as Bod, as he escapes the brutal murder of his parents and ends up in a graveyard where he meets a cast of supernatural beings and spectres and creatures and finds a family there. They end up raising him and it, it really is just this really lovely sweet found family and the reason that I think this ties into the Black Parade so well is it is dark, it is creepy, it's Neil Gaiman, it's always going to be, it's horrifically sad but there's also this real beauty to it, there's such a strong sense of hope and that even in really dark times, even when really terrible things happen, something beautiful can come out of it, something good can come out of it, and it's so important to hold on to that hope and that belief that things can get better. And also just like Neil Gaiman and My Chemical Romance are just a match made in heaven. Like, my teenage dream, I mean who am I kidding, I would still love it if it happened now, but my teenage dream was that Tim Burton would adapt a Neil Gaiman book and that My Chemical Romance would score the film. That was the dream. The next couple of game-changing albums for me were the Twilight soundtracks. So regardless of your feelings on the Twilight books or the Twilight films, I don't know if anyone can deny that the soundtracks were god tier. Like the Twilight soundtracks were incredible. Stephanie Mayer may be a terrible author but she has damn good taste in music <laughs> and a lot of the inspiration for the soundtracks for the films were taken from the playlists that she created for like while she was writing the books. It happened partly with the Twilight soundtrack but I think it happened more so for me with the New Moon soundtrack but that was really when I started getting into more like indie music and music that was a bit different and like I'd liked alternative music before I you know I listened to My Chemical Romance I liked like alternative rock but always the kind of alternative rock that you heard on the radio that you occasionally saw on TV like popular alternative rock that was very ready for the radio this was the first time that I can remember hearing music that was different that didn't feel like what I was hearing on the radio that didn't feel like what everyone around me was listening to and I really really loved it and I really connected with it and I liked that some of the music was strange and that it felt discordant and that it felt uncomfortable and for that I would recommend the Wayside School series by Louis, I never know how to pronounce his name, Saka? Sacha? I have absolutely no bloody idea but <laughs> This is the man that wrote Holes, which I still haven't read. Holes is kind of his most iconic book, but I really, really loved the Wayside School series when I was younger. Much like the Twilight soundtracks were some of the first times that I'd heard like slightly weird, different music. When I read the Wayside School series, it was the first time that a book had made me feel that same kind of weird feeling, although it was years before I discovered Twilight. <laughs> so these are middle grade books, I'd, I'd say even slightly younger than middle grade, they're set at Wayside School and they are kind of a short story collection, like each chapter is kind of its own self-contained story but because they're all taking place in the same school, in the same building, with a lot of the same characters, the storylines do intersect and do merge and the most bizarre things happen at the school and like no one cared. Like no one batted an eyelid when like a kid disappeared for six months and it was so surreal, it was so different. I read a great article a couple of years ago and if I can find it I'll link it in the description but it was this person saying that the Wayside School series was what paved the way for them to become a fan of like Murakami in their later life because it was the first time that they'd experienced this like very weird surreal way of writing and storytelling and they are just absolutely exquisite and I can't recommend them enough. Then I reached a point in my life, in my teens, where I was starting to connect with my faith a lot more and 
my sister gave me this amazing album called Over and Underneath by a worship band called 10th Avenue North and they to this day are probably my favorite worship band of all time like in the sort of 15 years that I've had an awareness of worship music and of Christian music I've never found another band or another artist that hit me the same way that they did and I think one of the reasons that I love them so much is a lot of worship music is or most worship music I would go so far as to say is just like rah rah yay yay Jesus and like that's great and <laughs> obviously that's that's kind of the point you know worships right there in the genre name but I just found that 10th Avenue North had a much more human approach to their music and it was less rah rah Jesus and more I am broken and messy and life is really really rough but with the help of my faith with the help of Jesus I can overcome that life can be beautiful life can be good and it spoke to me in a way that no other Christian music had because it showed me that I didn't have to be happy and perfect and bubbly and jumping up and down all the time. I could be messy, I could be broken, I could embrace those sad, dark, difficult parts of myself and it reminded me that I was worthy of love regardless of all of those things. I didn't have to be fixed and I didn't have to be perfect before I was worthy of love, like I was worthy of love as I was and that was the time in my life that I also started really to struggle with my mental health and that was a very necessary message for me at the time and that I didn't have to be healed and perfect, I could be broken and healing and yeah, 10th Avenue North still to this day I love so much. For them, I'm gonna recommend The Perks of Being a Wallflower because much like 10th Avenue North was the first time that I saw a lot of myself and my struggles with figuring out where I was spiritually with like the broken messy parts of myself in and I saw all those things represented in music. The Perks of Being a Wallflower was the first time that I saw all of those messy parts of myself being represented in a book. We follow a boy called Charlie across his first year in high school as he navigates trying to make friends and trying to deal with his family and some like trauma from his childhood that he's been repressing, suppressing, undealt with trauma from his childhood that starts to rear its head and starts to impact him and influence him and it's a really beautiful story about growing up and friendship and finding solace in books and music and films and art and finding wonderful friends and finding people who accept you the way that you are and that it's okay to be quiet and shy and awkward and there will be people who will embrace you like that and will bring out the best in you regardless and I love it so much it's one of my favorite books of all time and if you haven't already read it you need to. Then I moved into a very very intensely alternative era in my life and I feel that that was very much kicked off by Danger Days by My Chemical Romance. So I love My Chemical Romance. They are my favourite band of all time. I love them so much. They mean so, so much to me and that is really, like that started at this point in my life. I remember I, I won, I won an English competition at school and I got given a CNA voucher and they're, I guess you could compare them to like WH Smith I think, they sell like books and music and stationery. I went in with my voucher that I think I was expected to spend on books and instead I spent it on CDs and I bought Danger Days because I was like oh I like I really like Black Parade let me let me buy their new album this is cool and I went home and listened to it and I loved it so fucking much <laughs> and then quickly bought their two previous albums as well well no no I quickly bought Three Cheers for Sweet Revenge and then eventually for Christmas got bullets which was super difficult to find and had to be like flown across the country <laughs> for my Christmas present. <laughs> yeah and suddenly I was just all consumed by My Chemical Romance which developed to me being all consumed by only alternative music, like I only listened to alternative music 
I hated everything that was on the radio, I hated everything that was popular, and I was just like, I'm so cool, I'm so alternative, I am not like other girls, I was in a very heavy not like other girls phase, I was so obnoxious, I was so pretentious, <sighs> It was a time for me guys, okay? I've grown up, I've grown out of it. It was a phase, mom. When I say it was a phase, like I still, everything that I grew to love in that phase of my life, I still really love and those are probably still like my favorite things. It's my favorite, still my favorite kinds of music, my favorite kinds of films, my favorite kinds of TV. But I also now have realized that like things that are popular are not necessarily shit. <laughs> and I can like popular fun things as well. So just putting that out there. So based on all of that, all of that obnoxiousness, all of that pretentiousness. I'm gonna recommend Less Than Zero by Brett Easton Ellis. I feel like most of the Brett Easton Ellis stands that I have encountered on the internet, and I'm gonna put it out there, it is the male Brett Easton Ellis stands. that are about like late 20s, early 30s. They have high opinions of themselves. Not all Brett Easton Ellis fans, I mean I myself loved this book, but just like you know the type, right? Like, oh, yes, I like Brett Easton Ellis, like, I'm so intellectual. I'm so wise. Nothing you read could compare to the genius that is him. If you haven't read The Master, or you don't love The Master, your opinion is just invalid. Yeah. So this is about a boy called Clay, he comes home for his Christmas break, and basically just goes on a bender of sex and drugs and drinking and the whole thing is very nihilistic and I walked around like a zombie for a couple days afterwards because I was just like devoid of feeling <laughs> and it's a really depressing book to read and no it's not even depressing it just it, it genuinely just like left me feeling empty it was a very draining book to read I thought it was a very good book but yeah it was very very draining and while I really liked it Brett Easton Ellis fans in general don't like. <laughs> There's just like a very very specific subgroup of his fans who embody everything that I hate about intellectual snobbery and I will not pretend that I was not exactly that terrible and that obnoxious and that pretentious like eight to ten years ago. That's why I'm allowed to have such strong hatred towards them. Still very deeply in my alternative phase, I discovered The Emptiness by Alisana, which is an incredible concept album inspired by lots of dark things, but mostly by Edgar Allan Poe, and specifically by the poem Annabelle Lee, which I love, it's one of my faves. I love this album so much, if you have not listened to it I would highly recommend it. There is also like extra material, so the lead singer, I, want, I think it was the lead singer, who also is kind of their lead songwriter, wrote like a series of short stories or wrote a short story that like lines up with and explains the plot of the album. The music videos are just god tier. It is an amazing album. I found it deeply inspirational in that period in my life in the art that I was creating, in the art that I wanted to create, it just, it's an album that means a lot to me for a lot of reasons and it's just, it's so good and I think is so unlike anything that I had experienced up until that point. And for that I'm going to recommend The Memory Wood by Sam Lloyd. I just, I get the same vibe, you know, like if they made a film adaptation of The Memory Wood, I feel like a lot of the songs from The Emptiness would not sound out of place. It's just so good. This is about a young girl called Alyssa. I think her name was Alyssa and she is like a chess prodigy. She's 12 or 13, she's a chess prodigy and she gets kidnapped at a chess competition and she wakes up in this like creepy stone house creepy stone cell in the woods really and realizes what's happened to her and this young boy comes to visit her one day says that his name is Elijah and from there the book really becomes like a battle of wits and a game of cat and mouse between the two of them so on the one hand we have Alyssa who is this very very intelligent girl who realizes that Elijah is probably her ticket out of here so she's trying to 
manipulate him into either freeing her or like getting information to the authorities or to her mother or like everything that she does is calculated to get herself free. On the flip side we have Elijah who this is the first time in 13 years that he has had a friend and he's not ready to let her go that easily. So every way that she tries to outsmart him and tries to like convince him that he should free her he like backpedals on he tries to thwart her plans without her realizing that he's thwarting her plans and without her realizing that he's like actively trying to not get her rescued while all the while he's trying to make friends with her and it's just like a psychological masterpiece i loved it and there is a very similar theme running through The Emptiness and The Memory Wood, but it is a spoiler for The Memory Wood, so I'm not going to tell you what it is, but if you read it and listen to the album, you will, def you will see what I mean. <laughs> and then lastly, we have present day me, and I would say that the two most <laughs> important and iconic albums to me in the last little while of my life you can probably guess but Folklore and Evermore by Taylor Swift. I adored both of these albums as you guys know because I did reactions to both of them. I talk about Taylor Swift a lot especially recently and these have really started to steer me to a more like soft girl kind of alternative so I've really fallen in love with Maisie Peters recently I really like Regina Spector. If you have any other recommendations along those lines, that would be great. I just, I love the vibe of these albums. I love, I mean, I think that lyrically they are both masterpieces. I think that musically they're both masterpieces. I just, I love the atmosphere of them and the aesthetic of them. And both of these albums so perfectly conjure up like a walk in the woods. And what book pairs more perfectly with that than The Raven Cycle by Maggie Stiefvater? <laughs> Obviously this is a booktonet fave, but if you haven't already read it I genuinely do urge you to try it. I love the series so much, the series and these characters mean so much to me. <laughs> Basically in the first book we follow a 15 or 16 year old girl called Blue. She lives with a family of psychics but she herself is not psychic but she does have a curse on her. She's been told pretty much from the time that she was born that if she kisses the love of her life she will die. So she's chilling in a graveyard with her mom on St Mark's Eve as you do and St Mark's Eve is the night of the year where people who are going to die soon. I think it's anyone that's going to die in the coming year, like their spirit walks across the graveyard, but because Blue is not psychic she shouldn't be able to see any of these spirits and this year she does. She sees a teenage boy and she hears what will be his last words and then finds out that because she is not psychic the only two reasons that she might have seen this boy are either that he is her true love or she's killed him and then as fate would have it he walks into the pizza parlor that she works in and she doesn't really want to be because from the first couple of encounters she is very annoyed by him but she feels just completely drawn to him and his friends and the series just expands from there it is has the most beautiful example of the found family trope we have a bunch of teenagers investigating a dead Welsh king. There is magic, there is mystery, there is mayhem, there is romance, there is friendship, such deep abiding friendship. I just I love the friendships in this so much both between the boys and between Blue and each of the boys. Like She has a very specific relationship with each of them and they're all just so special and I love it so much and genuinely if you have not read the series you need to because it's so good in every way. So there we have it, those are seven-ish albums that have been iconic to me at different points in my life and a book recommendation for each. I really enjoyed doing this and I do have a series planned that is like 
book and to music related, which I'm very excited to launch in the next couple months. Let me know in the comments what albums have been iconic in your life and if you feel so inclined then leave a book recommendation as well. Feel free to, you know, judge my taste in music and judge my taste in books, but please be warned I will cry if you're mean to me. Thank you very, very much for watching. If you did enjoy this then please don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe if you aren't already. If you head into the description you'll find links to all of my social media, that's my Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Goodreads, as well as my blog. You'll also find links to my Patreon, my Redbubble, my coffee, my online store, and my Blackwells affiliate link if you'd like to support me on any of those. But that is it for me today, and I shall see you all again very soon. Bye! My life is grounded in a firm routine of coffee, sleep, and